Annyeonghaseyo, you. Annyeonghaseyo, hey you. It's Ataya, and welcome back to the channel. This is it's best to encourage you to believe in your ability to learn Korean. So I get a lot, like a lot, a lot of questions about my time studying abroad in South Korea and the cultural internship that I did at Suncheon Hyundae. So as you know. Or may not know, I spent two semesters at Suncheon Hyungdae back in 2016, which yes, I know that was a while ago, but I still get a lot of questions about it. So here we are today filming it, this video. Um, so while today's video is about why I chose Korea and Suncheon Hyungdae and the application process and money, <laughs> um, the next few videos in the series are gonna be about student life, like classes, clubs, making friends, culture shocks, what I wish I knew beforehand, all that kind of fun stuff. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the video. Go, go. So let's start off by talking about why I chose Korea and ultimately why I chose Suncheon Hyungdae. So I have mentioned this a few times before on my channel, but um, originally I was planning on going to Beijing and studying abroad at Tsinghua University. Like I had been planning on that for several years. I had been studying Mandarin for about four years at that point and um, yeah, <laughs> but about two to three weeks before my application was due, I found out that Tsinghua uh, did not guarantee their exchange students a dorm. They kind of basically said like, you might get a dorm, you might not get a dorm, you won't really know until you get here. And that might've changed since then, but that really stressed me out. So I started looking at off-campus housing around the university and I found that it was gonna cost me a lot more than I was willing to pay. And yes, I do say I because if I wanted to study abroad, I was responsible for covering all the study abroad expenses, which would include housing. So I started looking at other programs within China as well as programs in other countries. And so when I found the partnership program that my university had with Suncheon Hyungdae, right, in Korea, I was very interested in learning more because I had kind of had like this warm, fuzzy feeling towards Korea due to all the K-pop that I had been listening to for the past six years. It's kind of like that warm, fuzzy feeling that I had towards China because of my language study, even though I'd never actually been to Korea and I'd never really been to China, but like, I'm sure you know what I mean. Like, you're probably in the same boat and that's why you're watching this video. So I was very interested in this program uh, in Korea as opposed to the programs like in Japan and Vietnam and all the other Asian countries. And as I came to learn more about the program at Suncheon Hyungdae, I found out that it is unlike any other study abroad program that I had found and it's unlike any program that I have heard of up and like up until this point I say that because it's not just a study abroad program it's also a cultural internship program what does that mean you ask well for starters it means that I was paid to participate which was a big deal to me considering I was financing this whole experience myself there's that but um, we'll get into that later when we talk about costs and scholarships and stuff it also meant that I was guaranteed a dorm <laughs> in a special dorm called Global Village or GV. It's that one. I lived in that building, so I used to be in that window right there. And then my first semester was that one. And then the second semester, I was on like on the bottom. It meant that I was going to be guaranteed a Korean roommate. I know. <laughs> this is Yeri. I'm Yeri. Camera up, so don't be scared. Yeah, just say it. But Hagi Sogi, Yeji Sogi. Ah, Korean ballet. Yeah, Korean ballet. <laughs> it meant that I was going to have 11 other sweet mates, or not 11, I guess 10 sweet mates if you don't include my roommate. Um, and those were going to be both Korean students and other foreign students, which was like really, really exciting. It also meant that I was going to be assigned six to eight Korean students um, to meet with every week. Like basically like six to eight hours of like, you have to do a cultural exchange with these Korean students. And the point of this cultural exchange like time was to have like, not necessarily one-on-one -on -one sessions, but like you have to like, you had like buddies basically and you had to hang out and you had to like do cultural exchange, which means you just get, you basically get to hang out with them. Um, and then there were other parts of the program which were like you have to take like this certain class and things like that But to me when I found out that I was gonna get a Korean roommate and I was Basically the university was going to give me a lot of opportunities to mingle with the Korean student population That was a big deal because if I had gone to Tsinghua I would have been put in like a foreigner dorm and there was no guarantee that I was going to interact with the Chinese students um, So like that was like whoa and so even though I had a lot of like sleepless nights over like, do I pick Tsinghua and 
study more Chinese? Or do I go to Korea where I don't speak the language, but I get to hang out with the Korean students, like, and have like a more immer I'm not gonna say a more immersed experience, but a more, I don't know, I'm just gonna get to assimilate more into the society than, uh, than if I had gone to China. I guess so yeah I ended up choosing Korea because I felt like even though I didn't speak Korean and unfortunately I wasn't going to be able to use my Mandarin skills um, it checked off more of my like study abroad wish list stuff uh, than China did so yeah I ended up deciding to go to Sunshine Chang Bay okay okay so let's talk about the application process so in order to participate in this study abroad slash internship program, your home university has to have a partnership with Sun Chun Hyung University. And I will leave a link to Sun Chun Hyung's website that lists out all the sister universities. Uh, see if your university's on there. Um, but yeah, you had to have a partnership. And then on top of that partnership, your university had to be from the Americas, Europe, or Australia. Yeah. yeah. Um, and granted this was like in 2016, so it might've changed since then, but at the time you had to, your home university had to be from one of those areas. Now everyone's application process is gonna be a little different depending on your home university. So I'm going to walk you through mine, which I think is similar to most American universities, but um, yeah. So for background knowledge, I attended Texas A&M University and at Texas A&M, you basically had to apply twice. So the first time you were applying, you weren't sending anything to Su Chunhyang. You were, it was basically just like an in-house application process. I had to tell Texas A&M why I wanted to study abroad, why Korea, if I knew Korean, what I thought I was gonna learn um, by studying in Korea. Basically like kind of, it was a lot of free response, like a lot of like mini essays on why I wanted to study abroad. And from the pool of people that applied to go to Sun Chunhyang University within my university, my university kind of decided who they wanted to actually endorse to Sun Chunhyang. So it was like, mm, let me gather all the applications. Yeah, you three look good. The rest of you, like, sorry, try again next year or something. Kind of like that. Um, so when I got uh, notified from Texas A&M that I was being endorsed basically to Sun Chunhyang University, I then had to fill out Sun Chunhyang's um, application. And to be honest, it wasn't hard. To be honest, it was less work um, than my American university's application process. Um, it was basically like it just, you know, personal information, like, you know, where you live and stuff like that. Um, however, I did have to submit a scan of my passport. So if you're thinking of studying abroad, get your passport before you even start applying because you're going to need that. Um, so get that. And then I had to submit a personal statement. It was like a one page essay, basically introducing myself and talking about why I wanted to participate in their internship program. And I think I also had to submit um, like a form saying that I was healthy, <laughs> that I could like mentally be in another country or something like that. So overall it wasn't that many forms, but um, yeah, that's kind of what it looked like. So I submitted that, I think in November to go in the spring and then uh, towards the middle slash end of December, I got this big, lovely package. <laughs> so I, it's, it's kind of funny that I still have this, but um, yeah, I got this package from Sujiang University saying like, congratulations, you've been accepted. Like here are the forms you need for your visa, blah, 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 blah. They sent me information on like how I needed to arrange my flights because they were gonna pick us up at the airport. Um, they walked us through like what we should pack, what the dorm regulations were, like all this like when you arrive type of information, um, as well as like the forms that I needed to get my visa. So similar to the application process for applying to the study abroad slash internship program, the process for getting a visa can vary depending on your like country in the US, we have a Korean embassy. And then I think we have like six Korean consulates scattered throughout, you know, the nation cause we're so big. So if you're in the US and this is specifically for the US, um, you can get your visa issued either through a consulate or the embassy. Cause the embassy is like in DC. And if you're not gonna go to DC, find a consulate. Even though you're listening to me talk about my experience, please, please, please check with your embassy's website in your country um, because I don't want you to be misinformed or miss a document because I didn't talk about it. So yeah, 
Um, anyway, so I live in Texas, so I went to the Houston consulate to get my visa issued. So I went with some of the papers that they sent me in this um, lovely package. Um, that was like my acceptance letter saying like, I'm actually going to a Korean university and they said that they're sponsoring me. Um, it was like a company letter saying that they're a real institution, stuff like that. And then I also had to prepare like personal documents um, and take them with me. So again, for the US at least, check with your consulate to see what documents they want you to bring with you to apply for your visa. So like I mentioned, I got my visa issued from the Houston consulate. I made the decision to drive up there because I was not comfortable with mailing my passport and all these private documents. And it took about a week for them to issue my visa. And at that point, um, I had a family member pick it up in Houston, but you can also have it mailed back to you if you live too far from any of the consulates. Also, pro tip, pro, 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 pro tip, always apply for the year long student visa. So there are two options. There's the six month visa and there's the one year visa. Even if you're only planning on studying abroad for a semester, please apply for the one year visa. It will save you like, oh, it'll save you so much time and effort if you decide to extend your study abroad. So originally I was only gonna spend a semester in Korea, but Halfway through the semester, I decided I wanted to stay a whole year. And I was very lucky that I had <laughs> been told to apply for the year long visa because when it comes to renewing your student visa, it can be difficult. I've heard so many horror stories of people having to leave Korea, fly to another country, get their visa reissued and then re-enter the country. And you don't want that to be you. <laughs> so just go ahead and apply for that one year visa. That's actually what um, my university said to do in this package. They said, even if you're gonna be here for four months, apply for the one year visa. So just save yourself some time and do that. It's time to talk about money and scholarships and like just the cost of participating in this program. So as I mentioned before, it was an internship program and I did mention I got paid. So perk number one of participating in this particular program was I got a weekly stipend of 120,000 won. So again, that number might be different now as like the time has like time has passed since I participated, but at the time that was about a hundred dollars a week that I was getting paid literally to just hang out with these Korean students, like those six to eight Korean students um, every week. Yeah, like honestly, they paid us a lot for not a lot of work. Like it wasn't something like, oh, I'm gonna like check this person's English homework or I'm going to help them practice these speaking skills or something like that. It was literally, we were just hanging out. That's what, that's all the program expected us to do. If we wanted to get coffee off campus, we went and got coffee off campus. If we wanted to go have dinner together, we'd go have dinner together. Like, although we had an assigned time that we had to meet and we had to clock in with like our fingerprints, um, it was very lax and like laid back. If you are like planning on participating in Sun Xiang's program, you should know that you don't get a stipend every week. Um, you won't get your first stipend until about a month after you've been in Korea because the way it works is you only get a stipend for the week that you are meeting with your exchanges. So like the first week of exchanges isn't until like week three or week four of the program because during the first few weeks, they are matching all the exchange students that actually arrived. And I say that because you'd be surprised at how many students say they're coming and then don't come. Um, so they're matching the exchange students that did come with the Korean students that have entered the program. And these are the, the Koreans that you're meeting with during these like exchange times are the same Koreans that are in the dorm that are like your best friend's roommate or they could be your roommate even. Um, so yeah, you're only meet, getting paid for the time that you're meeting with them. So at the beginning of the year, you're, or the beginning of the semester, you're not getting paid for those weeks where they're organizing you guys. And then I believe we didn't meet the week of midterms and the week of finals, I think. So there's like somewhere maybe like six to five to six weeks where you don't get your stipend simply because you're not working working. I mean, you're not hanging out basically. Um, so yeah, it was, it was great. I loved that. Um, then that was just perk number one. So perk number two was that the university, like this program sponsored about two thirds of your airfare. So they gave us 800,000 won, um, to sponsor our plane ticket to get 
to and from Korea. So if your plane ticket was $700, like you got to keep a little of that money. Um, if your ticket was more than the conversion rate, which I think 800,000 won is like 730 US dollars, like right now, I think. So if your airfare cost you $1,000, then you have to cover the difference between the money they gave you for your air and like the actual payment. So I think it's also important that I mentioned that you are not gonna get that payment, like that airplane money until you have arrived in Korea. So you pay on your own dime and then you get basically reimbursed. So for us, they split the payment into 400,000 won and 400,000 won. So 400,000 won came at the beginning of the semester when you got your first stipend payment. And then the other half came with your last stipend payment at the end of the semester. I think it's supposed to be like, 400 for your flight to Korea and then 400 for your flight home, I think. But um, yeah, that's how it was separated out. So that was just like unbelievable that they were gonna like literally help me pay to get to Korea. And then perk number three was my housing was completely free, like completely free, which was a big deal. Cause like I said at the beginning of this video, I was funding all the study abroad expense related stuff. So that meant <laughs> I got help with my airfare. It meant they gave me money to be there and it meant they did not charge me housing, which means that was not an expense that I had to worry about. Um, and the reason that we get free housing as exchange students in this program is because basically the Korean students that are your roommate and your exchanges are paying for you to be there. So our dorm or Global Village was the most expensive dorm on campus at the time. And I'm pretty sure it still is. Um, and that's because the students that are living there, the Korean students are basically paying for themselves to live in the dorm and for you to live in the dorm with them because they got to interact with you. They got to speak English. They got to meet people from all different countries and they also got to do the exchange. So those are like the three big perks that you had from like participating in this program. So in the end, the only things that you have to prepare money for or like come with money to pay for are food, because that's not included in your housing, transportation, school supplies and textbooks, like travel, like any kind of like fun miscellaneous expenses or travel expenses, that kind of stuff, you have to cover all of that. So because these are variable, variable expenses, I can't tell you how much you're going to pay, um, but I can give you some like tips on determining how much money you're going to need. The question you need to ask yourself basically is what kind of exchange student life are you going to live? Honestly, I think I can speak for everybody that um, we all spent more money in Korea than we spent at home at our home universities. I know that sounds crazy. I know people are like, oh, Korea is so much cheaper. Um, the prices are the same pretty much. If you're in Seoul, if you're in Busan, like any of those major metropolitan areas, prices are the same, they're not cheaper. Um, so yeah, we ended up spending more simply because like when you are studying abroad, you wanna experience everything. You're not trying to stay in the dorm every weekend. No, 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 no. You're trying to go out and travel. You're trying to, you know, go to that museum or that K-pop concert or whatever. Like, yes, if you are just gonna live in the dorm, you can totally make it off that 120,000 won. But if you are trying to do anything more than that, you're gonna need some extra pocket money to cover those expenses. And if you're living, or if you're going to be at Sunshinhyang, I should mention, cause I haven't mentioned this, Sunshinhyang is not in Seoul. It is one hour and 45 minute train ride from Seoul. That might sound bad, but it's really not bad. But it does mean that if you are gonna be going to Seoul, you're gonna have to like pay to go there. In regards to what kind of life you wanna live as an exchange student, you have to consider how much are you gonna travel? Like if you're at Sun Chunhyang, are you gonna be going to Seoul every weekend? Are you gonna to go to Busan? Because if I give you an example, like the amount I had to pay to go to Busan from my university, like KTX was $50 one way. So if I wanna to go to Busan, it's automatically gonna cost me $100 just to get there. That doesn't include like my actual, like where I'm gonna sleep. Um, and that's another question you have to ask yourself. Are you gonna stay in hostels? Are you gonna stay in Airbnbs? Are you only willing to stay in hotels? Because those are three different price points um, that you have to account for. Like if you're only gonna stay in a hotel, bro, I hope you are saving lots and lots of money because those can add up really, really fast. Personally, I highly recommend the hostels. I only stayed in hostels when I was staying abroad. They were really, really cheap, really clean, um, and you can actually get a private room in them. So highly recommend the hostels. Also like, this might sound surprising, but like money to do just like random things that come up. Like honestly, I was talking to my friend about this and the way 
you run out of money the fastest while studying abroad is like through all that stuff that just pops up. Like when your friend says like, hey, you wanna go to that Instagram worthy cafe over on like blah, blah, blah. You're like, yeah, let's go. And it'll cost you like 20 bucks, like 15 to $20 to go there because the coffee is overpriced because you know, it's super aesthetic. If you get a pastry because you're gonna take an Instagram picture, you might as well have a pastry and a drink. Like that's gonna be more money and you end up spending like $20. And that was one trip. And if you go like to multiple cafes like that throughout the semester, you end up with a big cafe bill. <laughs> okay, so it's like random sporadic stuff like that. Editing to tell you here, I meant to say 10 to $15 per Instagram cafe, not 15 to 20. Also, I'm specifically talking about those really, really bougie cafes, the ones that have like con candy swirls on top of your drink or have like ball pits that you go into or like rooftop cafes. I'm specifically talking about those. I'm not talking about the ones that are near college campuses. I am not talking about the ones that you go and like sit in for a really long time and study in. Those are way more, like way cheaper, way more affordable. If you're a K-pop fan, how many concerts are you gonna go to? I remember I went to one I think one got seven concert and it cost me, I think 120,000 won, which is like a hundred dollars. That's like my whole stipend just to go and to the concert. And it was in Seoul. So I had to find a place to sleep. I had to, you know, pay to get there, have food over there, which food in Seoul was much more expensive than food near my university. You just need to accommodate for these types of things. So I know for a lot of you or most of you, this will be your first time in Korea. Um, so I've made like a little list of like some expenses based on my experience and the other times that I've traveled to Korea more recently um, In the description box you can look at it to get like an idea of what things cost I highly suggest you guys do some math to determine what you need to save up Hello again. So while editing this part of the video, I noticed that it kind of sounds like I'm saying you need a lot of money to have fun while studying in Korea. That's not true. These are variable expenses like I was saying before. So you might spend a lot less money. You might spend a lot more money than what I'm talking about or saying in this video. Um, I'm just trying to make sure you guys have realistic expectations of what things cost so you can save up for all those things you want to do. And so that when you are in Korea, you actually have the money to do those things and you don't start wondering why like you ran out of money halfway through the semester. In in terms of scholarships, because I get asked this question a lot, are there scholarships to study abroad? The answer is yes and no. So I don't think it's very common for a Korean university to offer scholarships to people who are going to be exchange students. In my experience, if you are looking for a scholarship to study abroad, your best bet is to look at your home university. So for me, there were two scholarships that I was eligible to apply for. One was offered through my study abroad department at Texas A&M, so I applied for that one. <laughs> didn't get it. And the other scholarship that I applied for was through the business school. So I was a business major. So I looked at our study abroad department within the business school. They had a scholarship as well. And so I applied for that one and I got it. I know there are also some tourism like based businesses that do offer scholarships for people that want to study abroad. So you should definitely look into airlines, like hotel chains and anything else that's kind of like tourism or travel related. Sometimes, like I've seen it before, they will have study abroad scholarships that you can apply to. Obviously it's gonna be a lot harder to get them because there's gonna be more people applying to them than just like within your university. But if you really are needing funds like that, I highly suggest you start looking for them. Oh my gosh, guys, it's getting so dark on us. It's like thunderstorming and raining and yeah. But the last part of this video is a Q&A. So I had you guys submit some questions on Instagram and I picked out a few that were related to the three major topics that we talked about today. I'm gonna answer some of the questions that I didn't already answer um, in the video. So our first question from Instagram was, can you study abroad for more than one semester? Yes, you definitely, definitely can. I applied for a semester and then ended up staying for a whole year or two semesters. And honestly, with my internship program, you can stay for up to three semesters. So you can stay for a year and a half if you want to. The only thing is with my particular program, you couldn't apply for a full year at once. You could only apply for a semester. And then at the end of the semester, if you wanted to stay for a second semester, you had to go through an, like an interview process where the study abroad department at Sun Chun Hyung was going to basically like do a whole interview with you. They were gonna ask you, why do you wanna stay another semester? How are you gonna help the new exchange students adapt to life in Korea? What do you think you'll learn by spending another semester in Korea? Like stuff like that. It wasn't a hard um, interview. They kind of just wanted to see how sincere you are about wanting to stay in Korea. 
And I think the majority of the students that applied to stay a second or third semester did actually get it. The process to stay another semester depends on your host university. So if you're gonna stay at Yonsei or Koryode or Seoulde, um, I'm not sure what the application process is for that, but yes, you can definitely stay more than a semester. All right, the second question was, how do you know if studying abroad is something you can do? This is kind of a vague question, but I would definitely say, do the math in terms of like how much money you need to save up and make a plan. Like I was saving to go and study abroad since I was in high school. Like I knew it was something that I really, really wanted to do. And I knew that even though my parents said they were going to allow me like to study abroad, if I really, really wanted to, I wanted to make sure that there was nothing that was going to enable them to say that I couldn't go, if that makes sense. Like, I'm not saying I didn't trust my parents in the promise that they made to me, but um, I knew that if somehow we came into some kind of like financial difficulties or something, they would say, sorry, we love you, but you can't go. So I did my best to get as many scholarships as possible to save as much money as I could. Like I was working part-time jobs to save up money to go. Um, so if you want to do like if you seriously want to study abroad do some math to figure out how much it's going to cost find some estimates online i know your university should also give you like a price estimate on how much they anticipate that you'll need to study abroad so look at those numbers make a plan to be able to afford it um if it's like something like related to like your parents needing to allow you to go Honestly, anticipate every question they're gonna ask you. Your parents love you, they want you to be safe, and the idea of you going to a foreign country that they probably aren't familiar with can be really scary. Like, my parents literally flew with me to Korea because they were like, they helicopter parents, but also like they were uneasy with the idea of me going like to a country where they don't even speak Korean, right? So yeah so try and like anticipate all the questions they're gonna ask you and find that information out for yourself you're gonna have to do a little hunting you're gonna have to look at your university's website and the information they give you on your study abroad program you're also going to have to look at your host university's information on their website to see what they say and of course you should always have some kind of like study abroad representative at the host university that you can email and ask questions that's something that i had to do a lot of there's that and also I highly, highly, highly recommend that as soon as you enter university, you start looking at what study abroad programs you want to participate in and meet with your study abroad advisor to determine which classes you'll be able to take abroad um, so that you can kind of plan out like, okay, I'm not going to take this particular social studies class here in the US, like if you're American, because I'm going to take it in Korea or something like that. Like I remember I met with my study abroad advisor my freshman year, like my first semester of freshman year, because I wanted to make sure that like I wasn't going to graduate late by studying abroad. So our next question is, do you know if students from European universities that don't have partnerships with Korean universities can enroll? So I am not European, but I believe the answer is yes. You guys have met my friend Kathy in several of my videos before. She spent a semester at Sunjinhyang and then she spent a semester at Gugminde in Seoul. And our university does not have a partnership with Gugmin. She, I'm not sure exactly how she applied, but she was able to apply like independently uh, to study abroad as an exchange student at Kukmin. So you're gonna have to do your own research on how exactly you can do that. But yes, I believe it's possible because I've seen people do it. So yeah, so that's all I have for you guys today. I hope it was helpful um, and that I didn't bore you. But um, yeah, so I will see you guys in the next video in this series. I'll put the playlist right here so that when the videos are out, you can check them out. But anyway, I'll see you guys in the next video. So, tell me bye, you guys. Bye bye.